Chapter eight. I don't believe in ghosts. I wonder if something went missing. Maybe the dolls moved more. I know. The story was terse and ugly. The Chalor's granddaughter, Claire, had discovered the body of Margaret Chalor in the parlor when she returned home after attending a motion picture with friends. Police were called and they found James Trelore fatally shot on his bed in the couple's upstairs bedroom. The Trelore's little grandson, Paul, was at first believed to have been kidnapped. But when the police searched the house, they found him curled up fast asleep in the small wood storage closet next to the fireplace in the parlor. There were no suspects. How terrible for Aunt Claire, Amy exclaimed. Think what it would be like, Ellen, coming home and finding them like that? Stunned, she turned to the next day's paper. Sorry, Miles. There were interviews with the chief of police, the cleaning woman who came in three days a week to help the Trelores, and the handyman who took care of the yard and some of the household chores. The police chief said the search for clues was continuing. The Trelore's house was under guard and the grandchildren were staying with relatives while funeral arrangements were made. The murders were still front page news on the third day. Victims, granddaughter, and shock, Amy read. Ellen, listen to this. Claire Trelore, 18, is under the doctor's care after being told last evening that her friend Thomas Keaton was killed in a one car accident on Highway 131, the night of her grandparents' murder. Keaton, who moved to Claiborne a year ago, was identified by a friend. His car was traveling north at a high rate of speed when it left the highway and hit a tree. The accident was discovered by passerby early yesterday morning. That's terrible, Ellen breathed. Her boyfriend and her grandparents killed in one night? Amy's eyes were wet. And guess who keeps asking her dumb questions about it? Me! Oh, Ellen! She was remembering the conversation at the dinner table the night before. I even asked her why she didn't get married and have children of her own. How could I do that? You didn't know. It's really something though. All these years she's been faithful to her lost love. She probably cries herself to sleep every night. Amy tried to imagine Aunt Claire, so brisk and merry one minute, so touchy and remote the next crying into her pillow. Maybe, she said. At least this explains why dolls in the dollhouse bother her so much. They bring back a lot of really terrible memories. Darn, Ellen looked at her watch. I have to go home right now. We eat dinner early on Wednesdays because my dad bowls. I hate to leave. Are you going to read more? Amy nodded. I want to find out if they caught the murderer, she said. Maybe the police found some clues in the next couple of days. She walked with Ellen as far as the information desk and requested films of May and June 1952 papers. I'll call you tonight and tell you what I find out, she promised. Won't your aunt be wondering where you are? She doesn't worry as long as I get home before dark. I can make it if I stay another 15 minutes or so. Amy waved goodbye to her friend and then followed Miss Tatlock back to the audiovisual room. Can't you find what you're looking for? Miss Tatlock gathered up the first four tapes. I can give you the whole year if you wish. Amy said no. If the rest of the story of her grandparents' murders wasn't in the May and June papers, she'd have to come back another day. Hurriedly, she skimmed through the films, but except for several short articles regretting that the police had been unable to solve the case, there was no more information until the last week in June. There... It was reported that Claire Trelore was moving to Chicago and her brother Paul was going to live with cousins. Riding home through the quiet streets and out into the countryside, Amy thought about what it had been like for Aunt Claire. How lonely she must have been during those first months in Chicago, Amy felt a wave of homesickness for her own family. It was hard to believe she'd only been away from them for a few days. When she reached the house, her aunt was in the kitchen spooning a fragrant sauce over brown pieces of chicken. I hope you're starved, she said cheerfully. 
This is my favorite recipe, but it's too much trouble to make if I'm just cooking for myself. I could eat the whole pan full, Amy said. All through the delicious dinner, Aunt Claire chatted about her plans for the house. Today she'd arrange for an appraiser to come in and look over the furniture. When that was done, she would set a day for an auction. I'll put aside what I want and your father and mother can take what they want and we'll get rid of everything else at the sale. What a relief that'll be, she grinned at Amy. This, is pro this probably seems pretty dull stuff to you, but I'm going to feel like a new woman when this house is sold. Meanwhile, I'm glad we're going to have a party before we say goodbye to the old place. I want to go home tomorrow after school and pick up some tapes and my tape deck, Amy said. Aunt Claire bit her lip. Oh, she exclaimed. I was supposed to tell you to call Luann as soon as you got home. She called and wanted to talk to you. Was anything wrong? Amy felt a familiar twinge of guilt. I don't think so. But Aunt Claire sounded doubtful. It's hard to tell, isn't it? She always seems kind of gruff. She doesn't mean to sound that way, Amy said. It's just that when she has something on her mind, she doesn't think about anything else. Aunt Claire smiled. You're an understanding sister. No, I'm not, Amy said, turning red. Ooh, scared Miles. Was Aunt Claire being sarcastic? I'd better call right now, she mumbled and hurried down the hall to the phone. Luann must have been waiting. Her deep hello broke into the first ring and she began reciting her news as soon as she was sure it was Amy at the other end of the line. I know how to weave, she said. I have a pot holder. That's terrific, Luann. Did you learn how, did you learn how at school? Mrs. Peck taught me. She's really smart. She taught me and taught Marissa. Marissa was Mrs. Peck's granddaughter. She was a year, she was a year older than Luann and a classmate at the Stadler School for Exceptional Children. Marissa stayed with her grandmother after school until her mother came to pick her up. My pot holder is prettier than Marissa's, Luann went on. I'll make you one if you want me to. Great, Amy said. You can make one for Aunt Claire too. Silent. Just you, Luann said finally. When are you coming? When are you coming home, Amy? Well, I'm stopping in tomorrow afternoon for a few minutes, Amy said. I have to pick up some tapes for the, some tapes I want. I'll see you then, okay? Tell mom, okay. Luann liked carrying messages. Goodbye, the receiver clicked. I shouldn't have told her it was coming, Amy thought. I could have picked up the tapes while she was at Mrs. Peck's. She'll just get upset again when I leave. But she felt better for having talked to her sister. If Luann was having fun with Mrs. Peck and Marissa, Amy didn't feel so, feel so guilty about being away. She decided to call Ellen before doing her homework. I checked all of May and June. She said in a low voice, they didn't find out who did the murders. Ellen whistled, not even a clue? Amy, maybe the killer is still here in Claiborne. Maybe it isn't such a great idea to be living way out there in the middle, in that old house. He might come back and after 30 years, Amy scoffed, why would he do that? Still, Ellen insisted, I wouldn't like staying in a house where people were murdered. Even 30 years ago, it could be haunted. Amy had been trying not to think about that. The parlor where her great grandmother had died was only a few feet away. I don't believe in ghosts, she said more bravely than she felt. And I guess Aunt Claire doesn't either, or she'd never have come back here to live even for a short time. Listen, Ellen, do you want to go back to the library with me next week and check out the rest of the tapes of 1952? Maybe they caught the killer later. The last thing I found today was an article telling about Aunt Claire going to Chicago and my father being adopted by some cousins. The floor creaked behind her and she whirled around to discover Aunt Claire standing there, white faced, holding a large cardboard carton. I have to go. See you tomorrow. Amy hung up the phone. It was Ellen, she said, unable to meet her aunt's eyes. I'll carry the stuff. Where do you want it? Aunt Claire turned away. 
It's some pieces of the best china, she said. Her voice was cold. I'm going to put them up in the attic with the rest of the set so the appraiser can tell how much they, there is. She shot a furious glance over her shoulder. You must have a lot more telephoning to do. Everybody loves hearing about a gory murder. Amy felt as if she had been slapped. I wasn't gossiping it, Claire, not really. I just wanted to know what happened to Grandma and Grandpa, and I haven't told anyone but Ellen. She was with me when I found the stories in the papers. Aunt Claire started up the stairs. I'm sorry, Amy said. I know I keep saying and doing the wrong things, but I don't mean to make you feel bad. Don't bother to apologize, Aunt Claire snapped. You admit you're curious. Don't expect me to like it. The past is dead, and it would help a lot if you'd leave it that way. You needn't go back to the library either. The police didn't find out who killed them. At the bottom of the attic stairs, she stopped and waited for Amy to open the door. I think I'd like to be alone for a while, she said and went on up the steps, puffing a little with the weight of the boxes. Amy was close to tears. This time, she made a real mess of things. Why didn't I wait until tomorrow to ask to talk to Ellen, she mourned. Now Aunt Claire is disgusted with me and I don't blame her. The hall was dark and the house was the hall was dark and the house was very still except for Aunt Claire's steps overhead. With dragging feet, Amy made her way down the hall, past the bedroom where her great grandmother was killed. She had just reached her own room and had her hand on the light switch when a strangled cry broke the silence. Aunt Claire? Amy raced back down the hall. Aunt Claire, are you okay? There was no answer. Amy ran up the attic steps. Her aunt was standing in the far corner of the attic, staring in horror at the dollhouse. How could you do it? She cried. How could you do such a cruel, ugly thing? Do what? Amy hurried to her aunt's side. The dollhouse was open and the small box that held the dolls were open too. The girl doll was back in the box. The grandfather doll lay face down across the bed in the master bedroom and the grandmother stood where Amy had seen her, had last seen her in the parlor. Aunt Claire bent, robot-like, and reached into the parlor, carefully avoiding the doll that balanced against the bookcase. With a fingernail, she loosened a tiny latch in the wall and opened the wood closet door next to the fireplace. The boy doll lay inside, its head pillowed on a log and length of a pen. She stood up. This is unforgivable, Amy, she said in a voice of ice. I suppose you have a right to know our miserable family history. I can try to make myself understand your need to find out, but to make a game of the deaths of your own grandparents? How could you? I d didn't. Amy's mouth was dry with shock and fright. I haven't been up here since Saturday when I showed the dollhouse to Ellen. We put all the dolls around the dining room table and that's how we left them. Should she tell about seeing the grandmother doll in the parlor only minutes later? Her head whirled. I mean, she said, I think don't make it worse by lying, Aunt Claire said. I just can't imagine how you could. But I closed the front of the house on Saturday, Amy protested. I know I did. And I didn't put the dolls where they are now. Aunt Claire just looked at her. I'd appreciate it if you'd put all the dolls back in the box where you found them and leave them there. She said, permanently. Amy felt numb. She'd never been called a liar before. Trembling, she knelt and collected the dolls. She laid them in a row and closed the box with care. Then she stood up and faced her aunts. I really didn't move the dolls, Aunt Claire, she said, and I didn't try to find out what happened to Great Grandma and Great Grandpa, Great Grandpa Trelord just so I could gossip with Ellen about it. I wanted to know. You wouldn't talk about it, and I knew my folks wouldn't either. So I decided to find out by myself. She paused. Aunt Claire was staring into the dollhouse, almost as if she didn't hear. I didn't move the dolls, Amy repeated. She searched for a way to prove she was telling the truth. I just found out about the murders after school today, Aunt Claire, and I haven't been up here in the attic since. You know I haven't. I don't know anything, Aunt Claire said, and now she sounded more sad than angry. She closed the dollhouse and replaced a sheet that had covered it the first time Amy saw it. If you didn't move the dolls, who did? She asked. Tell me that. Amy couldn't answer. It was a dramatic chapter.